Barney Village Church, let's stand together, let's sing and magnify the name of the Lord. Where creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry, then from no
not forsaken. You are for me and not against me. I want you to declare those words. Realize that this is God speaking to you. Understand what he's done for us. He has made you his. You are etched in the palm of his hand. It's not what anybody else says that we are. It's who he says we are. And he loves us. So let's declare that.
Good morning, everybody. How are you this morning? Yes, you got some gas in your tank, so do I. I'm excited to jump into 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 7 to 11. If you have your Bibles, get there now. Don't be shy. If you don't have a Bible, don't be shy about it either. You can head out these doors, make sure you come back, but grab a Bible on the outside. Outside of every single location, we have Bibles for you. It's our gift to you. We want you to be in the word of Jesus. We want you to understand God's heart for you and for humanity. And we want this to inform your life more than anything else does. Because life gives you all of these different ups and downs and all over the places, and I've experienced that too. Anybody ever been rightfully accused of something in their lives, but shocked by it? Uh, My my family and I, we travel, um, recently we're traveling, and my kids, uh, because we want to save money, we pack one bag that's being checked. So we have a family of six, there's four kids, my wife and I, and we say one bag only is getting checked, and that is a feat to itself, but we give each one of the kids backpacks to pack. So they're packing stuff in their backpacks, and of course we check in their backpacks to make sure there's only acceptable things that are in there, because you never know the mind of a five-year-old and what they might put in a backpack. So we're going through security and we put our backpacks in the trays and they go through and sure enough, all the backpacks make it through except for mine, the last one. It gets t- taken off to the other chart and moved over. And so they bring it over to the spot and I'm standing in front of the, the border security agent and she's there and she takes it out and she says, do you have anything sharp in your bag? I said, no. She says, are you sure? I say, yes, I'm sure. She looks at the screen and she looks back at me. She says, are you sure? I said, yes, I'm sure. She's like, okay, I need to take a look. Is that okay? I said, yes. She takes the bag. She zips it open. And she reaches into my bag, takes a couple things out, and all of a sudden she pulls out my shaving kit. I'm like, oh my goodness, wait, no. There's a pair of scissors in there. I do have something sharp in my shaving. I'm sorry, there's a pair of scissors. So she opens up, sure enough, pulls out this pair of scissors. Sure, you can't bring scissors. Yes, I know. She said, is there anything else sharp in there? I said, absolutely not. (laughs) She reaches into the bottom of the bag and pulls out an even bigger pair of scissors. I'm like, what is happening? I had two pairs of scissors in my bag that I like, I, and so I'm rightfully being accused of bringing something across that I shouldn't be. And I'm, but here at this point, I'm trying to change the conclusions that she's making of me. Like, listen, lady, I'm not like I'm with my kids here. We don't have anything else nefarious going on. Like, you can keep the scissors. We don't need them. She's like, well, actually, you can keep one. I said, wait, what? I can keep one? That doesn't make sense to me, but okay, whatever. It's your rules. Maybe you keep both uh, just so we can all be safe. And, and, and so I, but I was getting accused of something that I was rightfully accused of. This is what's happening in this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul is being accused of two different things. He has accusations coming to him from the church in Corinth. Now, let me give you a little bit of context if you're catching up with us, if you're new with us, about what is happening in the church of Corinth. The church of Corinth is a church in a city that has a ton of great leaders around in the city. And Paul has planted this church or started this group of people meeting around the truths of who Jesus is and building an intentionally Jesus-centered community. But Paul has departed from the church and the church now is finding other leaders to listen to. And as they find these other leaders to listen to, which you and I do in our day and age too, right? We have leaders all over the place. I could probably ask you who are six people influencing your life right now and you can name them from all over the place, from Instagram and TikTok and your family life and your church life and all of business life and everything that you lead into for advice and wisdom and same things happening in the church. But Paul's noticing that some of the teachings they're leaning into are pulling them away from the truth of who Jesus is and the gospel truths that they know. And so Paul now is getting back into that. But they're saying, wait, Paul, actually, as we compare you to other leaders, we are now accusing you of two things that are different compared to the leaders we see. They're accusing Paul, one, of a physical appearance. They're accusing him not to have an eligibility as a leader because of how he's physically appearing. And then they're also accusing him based on his location and his vernacular based on his location. So how he speaks when he's there and when he's not. So there's these two primary accusations that we see the church lobbing onto Paul, that Paul is now in these verses defending but he's not defending them himself. He's defending them through a letter that is being read by a man named Titus and two other people traveling with him. So that's the context. A group of people hearing Paul's rebuttal and defense in the midst of an accusation that's actually true, but Paul believes their conclusions are false. So let's read the passage, and then we can really get into the meat of it. This is what it says in verse 7. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For if even, for even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening in my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that, we, what, that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. And this is the word of God through the words of Paul. 
And Paul, as he talks to the church, he starts off by saying in verse 7, look at what is before your eyes. Now, interesting thing about this translation, because sometimes we read that in a plain reading, even with the context, we're not totally sure what it means. Is, are they, is, is he commanding them or directing them to look at what they see? What is he actually saying? And you'll notice that as you read your Bible, even some of you in this room, you may actually carry a different translation of the Bible, a different English translation or another translation from another language, and that might actually change the plain reading of what you are. And people ask me, even as a pastor, like, what is the best translation to use? Well, here at Village Church, we, we teach from the English Standard Version. That's what we've been teaching from the whole time. Those are the Bibles that we have available to you. But other translations do a great job as well in actually decoding what the Bible's meant to say and trying to say. And the best translation, I love how a pastor said this, a best translation that you, that's for you is the one you actually read. <laughs> Makes sense, right? The best translation is the one you read. So if, you have, if you're having trouble keeping up in this standard, there's a whole bunch of other ones. But let me show you how it kind of works in the midst of translations. This is the same verse in five different translations of the Bible, the first being the English Standard Version that we all read just together. The second, the New King James Version. If you love Shakespeare on a Friday night, I think this one's for you. Okay. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? Now, that's pretty common tongue, but that's kind of asking more of a question. So we see it framed, if we contrast the two, a little bit more of like, how are you looking at things? The New International Version, you are judging by appearances. The New Living Translation, look at the obvious facts. And the last, again, with the North American Standard Bible, one of the most literal translations of the Bible in the English language, says you are looking at things as they are outwardly. Paul is making a statement and a calling out of the, of the Corinthian church, saying you are looking at things on the outside, is that's where you're focusing. And this is probably a question for all of us to consider as we engage with other people, as we engage with leaders and the motivations we might have for following them. The question is, are you looking at outward appearance and perspective and making your claims and your decisions around who you will follow based on what you see? You see, Paul had this problem because Paul wasn't a stud. And in the church around him, you had all these great looking people, and yet Paul wasn't one of them. Actually, Pastor Kristen read this to you once. I'm going to remind you of Paul's physical appearance, how he's actually being perceived based on who he is. Paul, this is written about him uh, 200 AD, a little bit after his death, but interesting enough towards who he was. So he didn't even get to defend this himself. I'm sorry, Paul, if this is not you, that we're keeping this one. Paul, he was a little man of little stature, thin-haired upon the head, crooked in the legs, of good state of body, of eyebrows joining and a nose somewhat hooked. Not a description you want living on in the legacy of you, hey? Amen? So he's short, balding, bow-legged, uni-browed with a hooked nose. And this is who people are seeing physically as Paul when he shows up in person, and this is what they're contrasting. And Paul's saying it's not just about the outside. It's not just about the outside. Don't perceive a leader based on just what they look like. And yet we do this all the time, don't we? In fact, some of us have a nagging suspicion that maybe some people in our lives have it easier because they're just so good looking. You ever believe that? You ever notice that about people? Well, your nagging suspicions are true. Let me read to you a study based on appearance. It has been well documented that people who are physically attractive, both men and women, enjoy a plethora of benefits and privileges in life from getting higher marks in school for handing in the same quality work to receiving more help when needed, from having an easier time job hunting to getting higher salaries, they have an advantage. Good-looking people are also less likely to be judged as guilty in a legal and courtroom setting, not to mention the obvious advantages they possess in the relationship and dating departments, not all of them. And even in childhood, kids who are cuter are often treated more favorably. So can we just wipe away the preconception that we'll judge the church that they're doing it and we don't? We do. In every realm of society, it is ingrained in humanity that we absolutely do perceive what is on the outside. But, you know, we might say our society, of course, we see it. Everything about our society is about the perception we see, right? We all try and do ourselves up, even in the church setting. Sometimes we try and doll up, we put on our Sunday best, we come in. We, we might say it's for the glory of God, but it's actually for the glory of us. We sit in a place where sometimes we, we are always assessing each other based on how we see, how we look, what we do, the affections, the accomplishments, all of those pieces. And it's, very quite, it's quite normal. But it's not just in our culture where everything's kind of put forward and put on Instagram and social media and things. It's actually been happening for a really long time. In the book of 1 Samuel, there, it follows this prophet Samuel and this idea of kingship throughout Israel. 
And there's a man named Saul who ends up doing something. The Lord sent him on a task. He's anointed to be king, sent him on a task, and he does what he wants to do in the midst of it. He kind of satisfies some of what the Lord wants, but then he notices some livestock good to keep, and he keeps it, and the Lord removes his anointing from him. In this moment, Samuel, the prophet, is now looking for other kings to be a successor to Saul. And so as he's looking, this guy Eliab comes, who is actually like tall and of good stature, and immediately Samuel thinks, this guy must be anointed to be king based on what he looks like. He'd be a great successor to Saul. But the Lord meets with Samuel and says this. The Lord said to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. It is in the heart of humanity to see and look at what's on the outside, but it is the heart of God to see what's on the inside. God is concerned with not your visual visual and physical appearance. He is concerned with what is happening on the most inner workings of you. You can be the most beautiful person on the planet, but if you're ugly on the inside, Without the grace of Christ, God will reject you like he did Eliab. Are you, as a follower of Christ, perceiving yourself and others only through physical appearance? Let's maybe take this into a really practical way. Are you prioritizing it to the extent that you spend more time looking in the mirror than you do looking into the Bible? Are you prioritizing to such an extent that you spend more time looking for leaders that you want to be like in physical appearance? Which isn't, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to be motivated. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to work on your health and fitness and how you look so you can have confidence. No, but is that the priority of your life? There's an interesting piece here where it's not only what we might see in ourselves, which is a great critique that Paul's pointing out, not to look just at the outside of things, but it's also, particularly in this passage, about how they're receiving Paul, so how they're receiving others, how they're receiving other leaders of the time, how they're receiving Paul. It's a question of how you receive someone else. And you know, as as a human being, one of the greatest things you can do is receive others well. Is that not true? Have you ever been welcomed really well? received really well. Maybe you have friends that you've known for years and years and years, and you haven't talked to each other for a decade, but when you get back together, you start right back off from where you left. Do you have a friend like that? Some of us have friends where we just know that feeling. You haven't seen them in so long, and you just catch right up because, because you just, you, no matter what's happened in the last decade, you, you immediately receive each other the same way you knew each other. So how do we receive one another better? What has to change in our perspective to not just look at the outside when we're caring for people? There are practical bits about how we listen to someone and how we don't immediately judge based on their physical appearance, but there's also theological, spiritual truths that might change the way we think at the foundational level about others. This is a a quote from C.S. Lewis in his famous survey, The, The Weight of Glory, and I think it might help us frame what it means to truly understand, receive someone, and see them as God may see them and desire them to be. He talks about glory in the way of how we see ourselves. It may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter, but it is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory, should it be laid on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it, and the backs of the proud will be broken. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are in some degree helping each other to one or other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and of the circumspection proper to them, that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. When you meet another person, the value we place into them is the one that God has placed into them. The value we should see one another should not be based on physical outward appearance or stature, social hierarchy, economic status. It should be based on the value that is intrinsic to them because God knit it into who they are. It should be based on that every person carries the image of the invisible God as they are image bearers of him. That they are made in the imago Dei, that is the image of God, that we all as human beings carry that just because we're made in God's image, just because he desired to do so. 
And that as we engage with other people, Paul's encouraging the Corinthian church as they engage with him to not just look at the outward appearance of leaders and other people you might want to follow, but to look at the inward, deeper things and values that they have and they hold. In the midst of Paul's teaching, he's a great leader. And in the midst of our lives, we should be corrected and sometimes just looking to the outward appearance, objectifying people in a way that dishonors God, but actually now stepping in and honoring them as image bearers of God. Let's move into the second half of this passage, of this, uh, of this one piece of passage. If anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself, just as he is Christ's, so also are we. Paul is saying, if there's anybody amongst you in the church who is confident that he belongs to Jesus, let him remind himself that just as he belongs to Jesus, so also are we. This is Paul going even further than the depths of a value of a person and saying there's even something greater that we should hold to in the midst of your accusation against me. You look to me and yes, I'm not the greatest looking leader in the world, but there is something we both hold on to. If you claim to be Christ, if you belong to him, then I, I also claim to be Christ and I also belong to him. There is a greater, more sincere, more important plane of existence that we all are part of as being part of Christ's body, as being part of a community that is bonded by Christ. This is how we should view each other. And I gotta tell you from an experience, even in being in a community group myself, where it's like, as you think of joining something, maybe a community in the church where you don't know people, there is a beauty in knowing that you all have something in common and that is Jesus. There's beauty in knowing that in the midst of, even when you're wrestling with your spouse or you're having trouble with someone in your family or you're wrestling with someone else in the community, you always have the common ground of Christ to stand on. So there's a mutual respect that you can all carry. Why? Because you've all been paid for by the blood of Christ. That's a deeper identity of who you are. And that's something you should absolutely hold to for yourself and for others. You know, something changes when you belong to someone. I think of my relationship with Mercedes. I couldn't imagine when I was 17 years old, swing dancing with the cutest girl I ever saw, that she would one day be the person that I would spend the rest of my life with. And now 19 years later, I can't imagine my life without her. I don't wear this ring as a symbol of my marriage. I wear this ring as a deeper thing. This ring says to the world, I belong to her. And the one she wears says that she belongs to me. And the beautiful thing in our relationship as we live it unto each other and unto Jesus and as we try and raise kids together and go through all of it, not only do we love each other, but we live in a way where we're for each other because we belong to each other. And that changes things. It changes who I am. It's interesting watching people like in early stages of relationships try and figure out and guess if that person's going to be who they can be compatible for the rest of their lives with. Because 18 years down the road, Mercedes and I are completely different people than when we started. Anybody look at their spouse and say, hey, man, you aged like a fine glass of wine. <laughs> Don't look at the outward appearance now. But it's really beautiful when you grow for, with, alongside one another in this. Why? Because we belong together. I belong to her. She belongs to me. And the same thing here where we talk about the, the follower of Jesus and, and God's desire for you to be with him, to belong to him. Hear this even if you're not a follower of Jesus in the room. In passages like this and the ones we see throughout Paul's letters and through the, the sacrifice Jesus made throughout the New Testament and all of God's love towards humanity, you just want to see how messed up humanity is and how kind God is. Read the book of Genesis and Exodus. It is people screwing up, screwing up, screwing up, screwing up, and God just being faithful, 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 saying, you belong to me. His desire is to be in relationship with humanity. And God's word for you today in the midst of that is that you were made to be his. You were made to be God's. I see from my life with Mercedes that I was like, in some way, some of you wonder, is there the one that I know without a shadow of a doubt, I was made to be in a relationship with Mercedes. And just this last week, someone reminded me, there's no marriage in heaven. I said, fine, I'll just be your best friend for eternity then. <laughs> like, without a shadow of doubt. And even greater so, the place that you will thrive the most, the place that you will find the most peace, the most grace, the most purpose, the most patience, the most fulfillment, is not finding, it, finding, finding or binding or tethering yourself to anything else, but only tethering yourself and binding yourself and belonging to the God who created you and the one who sacrificed you. Paul is highlighting this as a significant place of foundation for our relationships. Who do you find yourself partnered to? Who do you find yourself tethered to? Who do you find yourself tied to? 
There are three primary relationships where this can happen, where you can tie yourself to one another. Think of it this way. A lot of us tie ourselves simply to ourselves. This plays out in all sorts of different ways. You see it in marriages too, where they, they, are, they love one another, but they are for themselves. And that will eventually lead to a marital breakdown. They tie themselves just specifically to themselves. And what happens in your life, if you tie yourself to you throughout your life, even if you're trying to live it holy, even if you're trying to do the best you can and be generous and gracious and kind to other people and you're, you're living in a way that honors people, even if, but if you tie it to how you do, how you fulfill, how you acclaim, what you achieve, your whole life and your value of your life and how you perceive your self-value is going to go like this. I'm doing good for a while. Oh, that was a big dip. I'm doing, that was a hard time. And that ends up being the trajectory of your experience and relationship. Look at this in your relationship with Jesus as well because this is something of great deep discipleship for you. As followers of Jesus, there's a, there's, a, there's a thing that God and the Spirit of God does in our lives called sanctification. This is where he glow, grows us slowly into further reaches, into more and more of the image of Christ, right? He's growing us to be like Jesus. This is what sanctification means. And there's mortification and vivification, right? Mortification is where you put certain things to death. Vivification is where you bring certain things to life. So in the midst of your life, you're going to be walking this journey of sanctification and throughout your days, and they're going to be like, there are sin things in your life, tendencies you have, where maybe you're, you know, a chronic thief and you actually steal a lot of things and you don't try to feel like bear guilt for it, but you hold on to it. Maybe you're a constant idolater. You're always putting other things ahead of Jesus. You're pursuing and motivated by other things. Maybe you gossip because it was just too good of news to not share to someone else. There's all sorts of things. And if you tie yourself to you and your holiness to you, pursuing holiness is a good thing, but if you tie it to your own, your relationship to Jesus to you, what happens is as you're doing well with sin or things in your life, it feels good and you feel close to God. But as you dip and you make a mistake or you backslide or you sin that way you wish you didn't again, what happens is the value of yourself goes down and you don't feel the grace of Christ. And again, you get back on the horse and, oh, I kicked it for a certain amount of time. And again, oh, I failed and I drop off. And you feel this emotional roller coaster in your life because you've tethered yourself to you. What's another option? Another option is you tether yourself to someone else. You tether yourself to others. And, and so you look at great leaders in the world that you like is happening in the Corinth church. Great church leaders, great other spiritual leaders, and things are going really well with them. Oh my goodness, I'm tied right into them. Or you tie yourself even think just to how other people perceive you. You're a people pleaser. That's where you find your value. Coming from one people pleaser to another, it is a bottomless pit of despair. And as you tie yourself to others and you see few things happen, maybe it's with your friends and in that context, how they, how they didn't like what you said or things kind of hurt that time. Oh, but then we had a great night and everything felt good. Oh, but that kind of hurt when she didn't acknowledge this and I wasn't invited to that party. Or maybe you're following a great leader that you're listening to and oh, they're really, really great. And then they have a moral failure because they're broken and sinful and screw up. And you're again, even in the perception of your life and how you carry your relationship with Jesus, if you tie that relationship and tether it to other people, they're bound to fail you. But there's another option that Paul is saying. He's saying the greater of the options, rather than tying it to yourself or tying it to others, is to actually simply tie it to the one who absolutely is absolutely perfect. The one who will never let you down. The one who will never look at you poorly. The one who currently sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes on your behalf so that when you're screwing up, God's here and in his ear, not that one, he's mine. He's paid for, he's covered. Not that one, she's innocent, she's loved, she's mine. Not that one, she's beloved, that one's mine forever. Interceding on your behalf. And what happens then if you successfully, and it's a journey, yes, but if you successfully tether your relationship to Jesus, and as you continue to grow in him, there's only one direction it goes. And at the end of your life, when you're laying on your deathbed and you're wondering what's next, you aren't wondering, you're celebrating that the world of gain is coming to you because you are secure in Christ. Yeah, you can clap for that. That was a good run. And so just as you are Christ, just as they are Christ, he's saying, so are we. That's the foundation of what we're talking through. There is equal ground in the midst of the kingdom of Jesus based on what Christ has done for them. And Paul continues again in one of these rightful accusations. Well, yeah, for even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave us for building up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. Paul owns a little bit of his words in his letters, a little bit of the harshness, a little bit of what he's doing. Even if I boast, he says a little too much because Paul has been given 
authority by God for a task. God gives authority. In studying for this message, and this is a beautiful thing that Paul actually has, um, it's interesting to see just the clarity that Paul had in why his authority was given to him. There's a lot of people in our church, online, in the room, who carry authority, but have no biblical understanding of why they carry it. And the beautiful thing about this passage is Paul's going to give us the clarity of vision that we need. Isn't these, aren't these vision statements powerful things? Aren't they things that can change your life, right? Even if you think of like shows that have been popping off lately. Ted Lasso, what's the slogan of Ted Lasso? Believe, right? The team, believe. Believe that there's something more in you. Believe you can actually do it. Believe you can get back in the Premier League. Believe. What about like the bear, right? The chef, yes, chef. Every second counts. Can I just propose one to the church? If you are in Christ, if you follow Jesus, if you belong to him, if you've given your life to him, Here's the stag line. You guys ready for this? Change your life. Build others up. What? Yeah. Build others up. Paul clarifies this really clearly. Listen to this. He has authority given by God, which the Lord gave him for what? For building you up and not for destroying you. Your call as a follower of Jesus with authority is to build up. You are a builder of the kingdom of Jesus. You are a builder of other people. You are a builder. You're meant to build up. That means if you're a father, you're not meant to dissuade your kids and shame them and abuse them and hurt them. You're called to build them up. If you're a spouse, you're not called to degrade and like control. And no, you're meant to build up your spouse. Scripture's so clear on this. That everything you do as a follower of Jesus is meant to build. And it's the truth of what Jesus has done. One theologian says it this way. This is true of every level of authority that God has granted. In the church, in the home, in the workplace, and in government. God has established levels of authority and submission. And he did this to build up, not to destroy. If you find yourself regularly yelling at your children, belittling your kids, yelling at your spouse... If you right now are the abusive partner in a relationship with holding money or sex or time or affection and abusing the other person and manipulating them with them, if you are abusive with your words and your power, if you in the workplace abuse the people you work with, you are not in line with the kingdom of Jesus and you need to repent. Jesus is clear through Paul's authority that what the church of Jesus is to do inside of its walls and outside in the world is to build up others. That is the claim Christ has on your life. That's what it looks like, giving your authority to him and living under him in this way. You see, it's true of Jesus in every way. Jesus, he himself builds up. He is building his church. He himself makes holy his bride, the church. He himself encourages us, gives us new names, new identities, and new value. We are meant to build up in the same way. And Paul, in the midst of what he's carrying in this, and the authority of building and not destroying, he wants to kind of move back on some of the words and the things that he's been accused of. Remember, there's a second, a second accusation. The first was his physical appearance, but the second one was his location, how he speaks in his vernacular through letter compared to in person. And so Paul comes back to it. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters. That's not the point. The point isn't to destroy you or frighten you. The point is not to win the argument over you. The point of what he's doing is not to do any of those things for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when we're absent, we do when present. Now to build on what he's quoting here, I'm going to go back to the beginning of chapter 10. And this one, Pastor Michael was really kind to me and didn't teach it. And he said, I'm going to pass this along because last time he did that, I got mad at him. So now he's, he's, letting, me, he's letting me teach these ones. And this is what it says. It's interesting how it ties together. I, Paul, myself entreat to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you and bold to you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some of those who suspect us of walking by the flesh. You see, Paul was bold at a distance and timid in person. They're basically accusing Paul of being an olden day keyboard warrior. They're saying, Paul, you're so bold from a distance. And in person, you're just you're this timid guy. How can we, 
How can we really follow that? But Paul points to a couple of virtues in the midst of chapter, chapter 10, verse 1, that we need to cling to. And one of those virtues is meekness. Meekness is a virtue, and you think of it as a virtue even as Christ identified it in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. But this idea of meekness isn't something that we hold on to because I don't think we fully understand it. I don't think we fully understand what meekness means. Because when we think meek, we often think weak, don't we? When we think meek, sometimes a meek person is like a weak person, shy, skittish, a little bit off, not, not really like, that might be a meek person. But that's not what meekness means, not by definition or by virtue. Meekness is something so much more. Meekness best defined as a self-controlled patience. It's power under control. When I, uh, twice a year, um, or sorry, two times in the last two years, once a year, I get to go uh, with a, a leadership group of people from all across North America to Denver, Colorado. And we go up to the top of the mountains at this huge ranch up in the mountains. It's incredible. Bougie ranch. Like, I don't deserve it. It's amazing. But they have an option for horseback riding. The last time I went horseback riding, I was 18 years old. I thought it'd be great to take Mercedes horseback riding as a romantic gesture for a date and found out immediately that she's deathly allergic to horses. <laughs> Terrible plan. I haven't been on a horse since. At this point of my life, as I continue to grow, I um, wasn't sure, I wasn't sure if horses were, horseback riding was really my thing. So the first year I decided not to do horseback riding. I said I went shooting. Okay, they got a shooting option, like skeet shooting. And I've got to tell you, I represent Canada well, got second place in the competition. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. We made it. Really, really proud of myself. All that Call of Duty paid off. Um, <laughs> and then this last year, I was like, well, I'm going to go horseback riding. And I, I tell you, horseback riding is an interesting thing, right? You've got to hold your legs in a certain way. You've got to hold yourself up. And everything felt really good for the first five minutes. I'm on the back of the horse and we're just trotting and we're with a big a group of people and this ranch has so many horses and the guy's like, well, why don't we try loping? I'm like, what's loping? I'm not, in a, uh, I don't ever been to a question center. He's like, oh, it's just like a, like a little bit faster. It's not a gallop, it's a little bit faster. Well, loping might be for a man the most painful experience you can imagine. <laughs> loping is like you're going at just the right pace for the horse to come up into the undercarriage and hit you over and over and over again. <laughs> So just a shout out to the jock strap, 150 years this week, amen? Yeah, that's pretty, what a gift, what a gift. Um, so here I am loping for a couple hours, and my horse kept trying to eat the stuff on the ground, and my, the, guy, the guy is just like, oh yeah, that horse is bad for that, he loves to eat, but all you gotta do is you just gotta let him know, pull on the reins, and he's gonna stop. You gotta show him that he, you can't, he can't just let you do that, you know, you gotta show a little bit of control over him. And so I just control it. And this horse, like, it didn't, it didn't break a sweat this whole time. Like, two hours on the back of this thing. And this horse, it, it wasn't even hurt. Like, the power this thing had. And we get back, and I drop the horse off, and just to the right of it, there's a guy breaking in another horse who's kind of wild. And this, this, guy, this rancher's, like, breaking him in and breaking him in and running him. And it's mind-boggling to me that this incredible, powerful animal, this wild stallion, is being able to be, like, reduced and confined and controlled and then made useful when it was power under control. That's the picture of meekness. Meekness is not that you're weak and that you cannot do and that you turn the, your back on everything, you turn your cheek all the time. No, meekness is a, a Christian who has great power by the Spirit of God living in them who is under the control of God over them. So, so when we look at someone who is meek, and what Paul's trying to say here is, yes, there's, there's a, there are moments when it's appropriate for him to be tough in his letters, and appropriate for him to be tender in person. It's appropriate sometimes to be persistent in how you engage with people, but then also patient and present when you're with them. It's okay sometimes to be assertive in what you need to step forward in. Some of us need that, the confidence of Christ in us so we can move forward in a healthy way, but then also all heart when we're alongside them and with them. These are appropriate postures, both of them godly, when used as a meek virtue. But understanding Paul's heart in the midst of it as well is, is interesting. Because he said again in chapter 10, verse 2, yes, I have these abilities, and I'm humble when I'm face to you, and bold when I'm away. But then we see Paul's heart, but I beg of you that when I'm present, I may not have to show boldness with confidence. I beg of you that I don't need to show this kind of judgment and, and this, this hurt towards you. I just beg it. Can you, don't, don't put me in that place. The default posture, the desired posture is grace and mercy and meekness. It's like that old adage, it's better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the war. 
prepared for anything, prepared, but not having to use it. You don't we see this in the life of Christ? Jesus' meekness as a virtue, this humility that he displays throughout his life. It's, it's wild to think about Jesus and the abilities and the power he had. Just the meekness and humility he showed when he came and became human, when he entered into humankind, still fully God with all the power that he could have wielded, but fully human. He was meek, power under control. The instance of the passion, which is the whole journey he had on our behalf, where he was beaten and scourged and and murdered in our place for our sin, able to call all of the angels down from heaven, wouldn't even need to, could himself end the pain, end the torture in an instant, and yet for us was meek power under control. The way he carried himself. And Jesus invites us to that life that he displayed He invites us to that kind of a life. In Matthew 11, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He's inviting us to live in a certain way. These are Jesus' words for our lives in the midst of meekness. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, Paul is saying, Jesus is saying, there's a gentle meekness that can be found in you when you have great power, but have it under my control. And that's going to give you a whole lot of freedom. That's going to give you a whole lot of peace. To not be abusive and use authority in a way that breaks others down, but no, use the authority and the power I've given you to build people up. And Jesus displays not just his meekness through scripture, but also in the second coming of him. And this is where I want to land the sermon because it's, it's crucially important. The same heart Paul shows by saying, yeah, like, understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. There, there is, if you, want me to, if you need me to be tough in this moment to deal with sin, if you need me to be tough in this moment, there, there is a side that will have to do that. In the same way, so Jesus is with our sin, our affection, our life towards him. In his book, Gentle and Lowly, Dane Ortland states it like this. If we never come to him, that's Jesus, we will experience a judgment so fierce that it will be like a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth at us. If we do come to him, as fierce as his lion-like judgment would have been against us, so deep will his lamb-like tenderness be for us. We will be enveloped in one or the other. To no one will Jesus be neutral. The question before you that stands before you today is the same question that stood before the Corinthian church, the one that Paul is trying to drive at their conclusions based on true, true accusations of what he is. The conclusion and question is this, who will you follow? Who will you tie yourself to? Will you tie yourself to your abilities to hold it together and your abilities to know what's right and your abilities to create safety and comfort for yourself? Will you tie it to others and how they would teach you and guide you and lead you and how they would show affection to you and show love to you in a way that you feel love? Or we tie it to the never-ending, never-failing love of Jesus. Because that love is one that was displayed in how he died for your sin. That love was displayed in how he rose for your salvation. And one day, he's returning as a lion to those who oppose him. There will be a day. And so I urge you today whether it be in just a practical step of you saying, I'm going to repent of things in my life that I'm practically walking away from Jesus in. I'm going to, again, give my authority back to Jesus if I'm carrying it in any sphere. And maybe you haven't even thought about that lately. But my hope would be that even maybe for some of you who just have never, ever put in their faith and their hope in Jesus, that today would be the day that you do that. Today would be the day that you make an active decision in your heart and with your mouth towards Christ and invite somebody you love into that decision. But a moment where you feel the Spirit of God calling you saying, I made you for me, now come join me in this. I made you for me, now come live alongside, tether yourself to me. Are you sick of the ups and downs of all the emotional roller coaster your faith has been? Don't tether it to your holiness. 
Don't have tether it to your friends. Don't tether it to a great leader in the church. Tether it to the only one who is true. That is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Tether it to him. My hope would be that you make that decision. You take that step and live your life continuing to grow in the image of likeness of Christ from today on. Would you pray together with me? Jesus, we are so grateful for how you love us. We are so grateful that even in the midst of our shortcomings, even in the midst of our brokenness, our inability to sometimes see clearly the vision and the mission you have for our lives, how we're so easily swayed to other wants and desires, we ask and pray, Jesus, that you would help us in these moments where we consider you to be the ultimate leader and authority in our lives. We are so grateful for your great patience with us. Where we walk away from you, you consistently pursue us. We are so grateful in your patience, in the lamb-like tender nature you showed us when you were here on earth and the continued tender nature you show us now. That no matter what we've done, no matter how broken we've been, how far we've swayed from you, as we turn to you, the acceptance and the receiving is there. Always present. And forgive us for where we believe that you've been far from us. That's a lie we've believed. We recognize that you're right here. And so for some of us, Jesus, if you're calling us into that relationship with you, and maybe a moment might help us really solidify what we believe and what we're pursuing, then for those of us in the room who are in that place, we say thank you for never departing from us. We put our faith and our hope in you, Jesus, alone. We're done trying under our own authority and seeing how it destroys. We want to put our authority under you in a meek way, powerful, but under your control. And we ask that you would guide us in the steps of how to do that in a way that honors you, in a way that is righteous and holy before you, and in a way that so shows your glory to the world who needs to see it. And we pray this in your beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand?
worship you and tell you that you are worthy. You are worth all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Lord, I just pray that the seeds that you've planted in hearts today would continue to grow over this week. Lord, that you would help us and remind us that our identity, when rooted in you, is just exactly how it's supposed to be, how you want us to thrive. Give us that encouragement this week. Give us that hope this week, Lord, and help us to turn our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so grateful that you joined us today for this online experience of Village Church. And our heart would be that you'd actually take the next steps in what you've heard through the message today, even in 2 Corinthians, as we talk about who leads us and who should we really give our authority to and who should we follow in a meek way. If you've had some practical steps, I'd I'd encourage you to take those with yourself, but also take some steps to get into the community here a little bit deeper. That could mean maybe for you, even just coming to one of our live locations, check online at thisisvillagechurch.com to see if there's one near you, or also to connect into a community group so that you can really see this place, not just be an experience you have online, but a home that transforms your life. I'm so glad you joined us. I can't wait to meet you one day and we'll talk to you soon. God bless.